Rusija od NATO-a i Ukrajine traži sigurnosne garancije da se neće dalje širiti na istok. Od Evropske unije se traži da Ukrajine i druge zemlje ne budu razmatrane za članstvo. Kakve bi mogle biti geopolitičke reperkusije ovakve politike? Gdje se tu nalazi Balkan, posebno Bosna i Hercegovina, te koja će područje u svijetu biti glavna geopolitička bojišta? O ovome u nastavku razgovaramo sa Rose Gotemuller, prvom ikada zamjenicom generalnog sekretara NATO-a. Gospodja Gotemuller nam se pridružuje is a Stanford of California. Ms. Gottemuller, welcome to Program N1. Thank you. I said in my opening that the Russia is requesting from NATO and from Ukraine written security guarantees that the NATO will not go further on the eastern flank of um, Europe. And you were the first ever female deputy secretary general of NATO, such a historic position. But let me ask you for your comment on this request. Will ever NATO do such a thing? Or will NATO keep that policy of the open door as a core principle for its functioning in the future? Since Bosnia and Herzegovina are also on the list of NATO aspirants, this is a very important question for your country as well. And I can say very firmly that uh, NATO will never change its principle with regard to its open door policy because it is a, a key principle that is enshrined in the Washington Treaty, the founding legal document of the NATO alliance that NATO should maintain uh, the ability to welcome new entrants uh, from Europe who can provide uh, gains for European security and who also want to join NATO. That's very important. Countries need to want to join NATO. Uh, but also then, of course, there must be consensus among all NATO members for states to be admitted. Most recently, our new members in NATO are states from the Balkans, the Republic of North Macedonia, and also Montenegro. So I think uh, this is an important principle. It is not one that NATO will abandon. Ma'am, um, just over the weekend, the spokesperson to the Kremlin, Dmitry Peskov, um, said to CNN and our viewers have a chance to watch that um, interview. He says, um, I'll quote him in two parts. He says, well, all this started with the beginning of 1990s when Germany was reunited and when then Soviet Union and the Soviet Union leader, Mr. Gorbachev, said okay to that. There was a promise by American side, unfortunately not fixed in a judicial or uh, legal binding guaranteeing document, but it, there was a guarantee that NATO, NATO would never expand its military infrastructure or political infrastructure um, east eastwards. Um, you were Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Have you ever heard about such uh, uh, promises given to Mr. Gorbachev or to um, SSSR or Mr. Putin after that or Mr. Yeltsin since 1990s? Uh, this is a very important issue, and it is one that the Russians have been constantly hitting on in their media, but there were no such assurances given. And most importantly, I was working for President Clinton at the time. I was working in the Clinton administration, and I remember very clearly the many conversations with uh, then the Russian leadership. And it was related to really looking for ways to turn Russia into a strong partner with NATO, a positive relationship where Russia and NATO would work together to bolster European security and to work in many ways on important projects to ensure that Europe was whole, free and at peace. So there was never any sense that uh, Russia was given written guarantees, but there was also never any sense that Russia should be an opponent of NATO. Instead, the emphasis was on a friendly relationship, a good partnership, and a pragmatic partnership. So I'm so sorry that that history has been lost in the Russian discourse, because even President Putin himself was engaged in such cooperation. He uh, signed the so-called Rome Declaration in 2002, that launched a number of very important NATO-Russia cooperative projects and the NATO-Russia uh, the NATO-Russia Council. So it's not like President Putin himself doesn't remember a time when NATO and Russia were working together in a positive way. 
Now, another element here is your colleague from uh, Stanford University, but also your colleague from um, Obama administration, Ambassador Mike McFall, have written a series of uh, tweets just uh, at the end of the last week, and he says, um, if they're requesting what they're requesting from us, I have also a list of requests which we should ask for them. So he um, um, wrote um, there that Russia should agree to withdraw uh, forces from uh, Moldova, uh, Russia should agree to withdraw forces from uh, Georgia, renounce recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and he says Russia should agree to withdraw its forces from Ukraine, return Crimea to Ukraine, and stop supporting separatist forces in Ukraine, and what is more important, he says Russia should agree to withdraw the Iskander missiles from Kaliningrad, and when my colleague from CNN, Farid Zakaria, asked Mr. Peskov for reply on this, um, Mr. Peskov said, I'll just go to the Kaliningrad uh, element. He says, um, Russia will never discuss with anyone withdrawal of any missiles or any weapons from Kaliningrad because Kaliningrad is territory of Russia and with that, with all due respect, we will never tolerate any demands for us to do this or on our own territory. None of the countries will tolerate it, but they're asking this from Ukraine to do, to remove uh, weapons and uh, defense systems from their own territory, but they're saying on Kaliningrad that, that play uh, doesn't um, goes on because it's our territory, but we can say to someone else, remove weapons from your territory. How it's you interesting. Uh, it's interesting that Mr. Peskov said that because, again, President Putin himself has uh, proposed uh, a moratorium on uh, short and intermediate range missiles in Europe. I do understand now um, the Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, was in Geneva just a week ago talking to the Deputy Foreign Minister, Sergei Rybkov. And I understand that NATO and the United States are now quite interested in working uh, to figure out how to implement this moratorium idea of President Putin. Of course, it would have to be a reciprocal deal that uh, if Russia is withdrawing intermediate range missiles from European territory, then the United States would not deploy intermediate range um, missiles in European territory. So I think once again, I'd like to emphasize that there is real potential for some, some positive negotiations here that serve the national interests of not only the United States and NATO countries, but of Russia as well. So let's get back to the idea of mutual interest and reciprocity uh, and really look at some of these proposals that the Russians themselves have put on the table. With regard to your other notes uh, about the different countries, sadly, in which Russia continues to deploy troops, including Moldova and Georgia, Ukraine itself in Crimea, I wanted to just underscore that there are diplomatic processes to address each of these each of these so-called frozen conflicts. And I hope that we can use this current moment of high anxiety, stress, and tension to re-energize some of those diplomatic processes, the Minsk process with regard to Ukraine, and then the processes that relate to uh, Georgia and uh, Moldova as well. I think it's very important that we get back to the negotiating table and put some new energy into diplomatic solutions here. Ma'am, you were uh, one of um, key negotiators when it comes to new START agreement between Russia and United States, and that was a crucial agreement during Obama administration. But let me ask you this, you're talking about negotiations. How hard is to negotiate with Vladimir Putin and his um, administration, and also, if these negotiations fail to achieve that reciprocity and consensus between two sides. Do you believe that Vladimir Putin will try to do something similar to 2014? And is Ukraine the same as it was in 2014 when Vladimir Putin invited and enacted Crimea? Well, I'll start with that question first, and that is I'll agree with many of my colleagues who have been saying publicly, including U.S. government uh, officials, that no one knows what's going on in the mind of Vladimir Putin right now. I do uh, take note of the fact that he has referred to his uh, need to consult with his military leadership as to whether they proceed with military technical moves, such as placing new missiles uh, in uh, on their territory adjacent to NATO Europe, or whether they proceed with some 
some kind of uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. Nobody knows what the answer to that question is, but it seems that uh, that President Putin and his Kremlin advisors are consulting with the Russian military on that. So there is place there, I think, for a number of options and not only a military invasion, which has its own, I think, grave risks for the Russian Federation. Uh, on your other uh, question about diplomacy, of course, uh, negotiations only succeed in any setting with the Russians, with the Chinese, with any other country, if there is a sense of mutual interest and, uh, and a sense that uh, there can be a reciprocal outcome where both sides gain uh, some benefit. We can't have a kind of zero sum gain. That's not how negotiations ever succeed. And so I think uh, from that perspective, looking for areas where uh, we can find some steps in the conventional arms control regime, for example, where Russia will see its interests served, where we will have more predictability so that we know what they're up to and they know what NATO is up to. I think this is where we should be looking for the grounds for new negotiations. If the Russians are insisting on zero sum games, then it's not going to go anywhere. Um, we know that the NATO will have new strategic compass by uh, mid of this year and it will be adopted at the um, Madrid summit. Also the change will be at the helm. Your former boss Jens Stoltenberg will leave position after extension and extension of his uh, term. Probably member states were very satisfied with his uh, work and you know probably better than um, most of us. But what do you expect that it will be NATO's uh, future uh, engagement and the role. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg was saying that um, China will be at the top, but with this situation with Russia, uh, should NATO keep Russia at the first place and then China after that? Deterrence and defense of NATO European countries will always be at the absolute top priority for the NATO alliance. That is why that is why NATO was founded. It is uh, an alliance to really serve, uh, as I put it earlier, to serve uh, the purpose of keeping Europe at peace. Uh, and I think, again, that goal serves, that objective serves the Russian Federation as well. So I see that as continuing to be a top priority. I think what Secretary General Stoltenberg was talking about is something that is really unique from a NATO perspective, that is thinking through how NATO should relate to China going forward, uh, how uh, it can work with China successfully in future years. It is never going to be active in Asia. It's never going to see NATO forces, I think, deployed in Asia because NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So the center of gravity in NATO is in Europe and in the North Atlantic Alliance with the United States and Canada. So to make a long story short, I think those priorities will be there. But I think it does not mean that somehow uh, Russia is becoming less of a priority. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, you know the region of the Western Balkans and in uh, some sources and, and circles here in the Western Balkans, many were saying that there might be a trade between Russia and NATO to say, okay, we will uh, say that we are not going to move to the eastern flank, but uh, you will allow us to uh, consummate or take in our um, arms the rest of the Balkans, which is not in NATO at the moment, and I'm talking about Bosnia, Serbia and um, Kosovo. Do you believe that there is um, space for such a trade or NATO will always say each country has its own right to decide and we are not going to trade with the interests of countries just to satisfy big country as Russia is? Yes, what you're talking about is the formation of a kind of uh, zones of interest. And, and NATO is never going to agree to that. That is another basic principle. NATO has been very firm, and not only NATO, but it's part of the Helsinki Founding Act. It's part of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, those basic principles laid down at its formation 20 years ago. The main point is that countries are independent and sovereign. They should have the opportunity to decide for themselves what their national security arrangements should be, whether they decide to be neutral or they decide to join a security alliance. That is up to each country to decide and not for the big guys to decide. 
Ma'am, how do you see the situation in the Western Balkans, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina? You spend um, quite a bit of your time as a Deputy Secretary General working with officials here in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We know that the Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, called in uh, MAP uh, since um, years ago and uh, it didn't start that procedure, but also we have that objection from the part of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to go towards NATO. Yes, of course, it's a very fragile and complicated political situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I have the greatest respect for the politicians uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina with whom I met and with whom I worked, as well as uh, with many, many experts and, and public figures in the non-governmental world. And I know that there's a great effort uh, to work hard and to put together a continuing system of governance that will answer to the interests of all the all the different nationalities who are part of your country. Uh, it is a difficult and a delicate uh, working environment, I know, and uh, I really am concerned that there could be efforts to uh, undo the basic arrangements that were put together under the Dayton Accords. So I do hope that, uh, that uh, you in your country can find the balance among the different competing forces and be able to move forward. As I said at the outset, Bosnia and Herzegovina is on the list of NATO aspirants, and I would very much like to see it take its place along with other countries in the Balkans, including not only Republic of North Macedonia and Montenegro, but also Albania. Uh, and others who have joined NATO in uh, the recent decades. So that is a good goal, I think, to keep front and center, as well as membership in the EU, of course. You worked in several U.S. administrations. The Biden administration uh, recently has announced sanctions against the current member of the Bosnian presidency, former president of Republika Srpska in times when you were here working as a deputy secretary general against Mr. Milorad uh, Dodik. Uh, we know that the U.S. is issuing sanctions uh, time after time in situations like this. Do you believe that the sanctions are um, good enough or strong enough weapon to uh, calm situation here? here in Bosnia and Herzegovina and move it uh, forward to de-escalation and uh, protection of the Dayton Peace Agreement here? They're not the only, of course, uh, factor uh, in moving forward policy uh, in your region of the world as in any other region. I hope that they send an important signal, uh, first of U.S. support uh, for the, the health of your country, for the health of your governance system. And I hope that they also uh, provide some leverage to move things forward. But uh, they're an imperfect tool. We see this around the world. Sanctions by themselves don't work. There have to be a number of other, uh, a number of other efforts, including uh, the efforts of, of your leaders across the political divides uh, to work together and to find common ground. Are you worried um, when I put in front I'll put in front of you three uh, names three countries are you worried because they have influence here in Bosnia and Herzegovina in a different ways Russia China and Turkey <laughs> no I'm not particularly worried I think all of us have to juggle different uh, uh, different and competing forces that's the job of politicians right I happen to be out of the government right now uh, again, I think it's really important for the Bosnian leaders to, to really think hard and define carefully the national security interests of all uh, citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that means from the different ethnic nationalities. It's very difficult. It's very complex. I know you have a very, very difficult uh, political environment there, but I don't think that one can... Uh, stay awake at night worrying about different outside actors and how they are going to behave. Instead, I think the first uh, priority needs to be to have a clear sense of national objectives and of national interests. Ma'am, can I ask you how do you see the situation in Serbia at the moment? We know that the President Vucic is uh, basically juggling between West and East all the time and many were saying over the last few years to him that he can't sit at the two chairs at the same time. Well, I worked with President Vucic uh, quite often, visited uh, Belgrade a number of times when I was the Deputy Secretary General. And I frankly think not only uh, 
President Vucic, but also his government have been successful at establishing a good working partnership with NATO. Uh, Serbia is a respected NATO partner. They have taken important projects and implemented them. For example, the a uh, couple years ago, the disaster uh, relief exercise that was carried out in Serbia and very successful in pulling together participants from across uh, the Balkans to participate. And that, again, is to the good of, of all the countries in the region to have better means to respond in the case of environmental disasters, for example, that are affecting us all so seriously these days. So Serbia has worked well with NATO on a number of important projects, number one, uh, but number two, then uh, it's going to be up to Serbia to decide how they want to balance their partnership with NATO with their other interests. Clearly, uh, Serbia also has a very strong uh, working relationship with the Russian Federation, is buying weapon systems from Russia. NATO has no objection to this. It's, uh, again, I think it's important to stress that every country should decide for itself its own security arrangements. And if that includes partnership with NATO and also working together with Russia, that's not up to NATO to be concerned about. Let me ask you also about um, some diplomatic representatives which are coming here in the region of Western Balkans. Biden administration is uh, sending Christopher Hill, well-known diplomat here in the Western Balkans, uh, but also Michael Murphy, who's coming back to Bosnia and Herzegovina to serve as ambassadors to Sarajevo. How important for the U.S. administration is to have um, career diplomats here uh, doing the work um, in such a challenging uh, area of the world? I think your country is very lucky to have such a skilled ambassador. And of course, Christopher Hill, of course, these are very impressive diplomats. And I do hope that they can help uh, to make a real difference in moving forward the security agenda, as well as the political and economic agenda for your country, because uh, progress has to be made in all of those areas, I know, uh, in order for Bosnia and Herzegovina to be a success. So I think the uh, the skill and, and capability of, of those impressive diplomats, I hope, will, will help to move the agenda forward. Um, I have uh, just a few more questions for you before the end of this interview. One is, I said earlier in this interview that the Jens Stoltenberg is leaving a position of the Secretary General probably later this um, year. You were the first female Deputy Secretary General in the history of the Alliance. Can we expect soon to see a first female Secretary General of uh, NATO? It's uh, something I hope for, but it's clearly up to the NATO allies to figure out who the candidates will be. And then there will, I'm, sh I'm sure, be uh, due consideration of all the candidates. I hope there will be some women on that list. I can't tell at, at the moment, but I think it is uh, for all international organizations. I think it's high time that they consider uh, women leadership. The leader of the OSCE uh, now in uh, in Vienna is Helga Schmidt. I uh, applaud that very much. Uh, we have uh, Madame von der Leyen, uh, said of the European Commission. I applaud that very much. So I think uh, it's high time NATO take a look at women candidates as well. And my last question is, we are at the start of uh, 2022. We know that the last year was very challenging with the pandemic, all security um, issues, political changes in the United States, political changes in Europe. More changes are coming here in Europe with elections in several European countries, including France. What do you expect from 2022? Will this year be the year of um, exit from pandemic and changes, positive changes, or we will still have a hard year ahead of us? I'm afraid the Omicron variant is uh, making it very hard to, uh, to see an exit from this pandemic. And so I think we will all have to continue to be patient, to take the medical steps needed uh, to get vaccinated, to wear our masks, to stay separate, <laughs> but also to, um, to try to uh, work again uh, to uh, support the medical uh, and research communities as they look for, for solutions going forward, because I think we have got to, uh, to be honest with you, to live with, with uh, COVID-19 as, uh, as something that will be part of our lives. So figuring out the best and most effective way to do so will be important for all of us. But for the rest, I do hope that 2022 will be a year when we can see some success in terms of 
putting in place more, greater stability and more peaceful relations across the European continent from the Balkans all the way up to Norway. Uh, so let us hope for that. Um, it doesn't look so good right at the moment. It looks like a very difficult environment given uh, what Russia is up to on the borders of Ukraine. But nevertheless, I'm going to take the optimistic view that we can hope for better and we will certainly strive for better in 2022. Ma'am, thank you so very much for your time and for this interview. And I hope that we will have a chance to speak again in 2022 and review all the issues which we were discussing t this evening. Thank you for your interview. Very, very good interview. Poštovani gledalci, čuli se šta kaže Rose Gotemoller, nekada zam, nekadašnja zamjenica generalnog sekretara NATO. A geopolitička situacija u svijetu u 2022. sigurno će biti zanimljiva, zato ostanite uz program Enedeng gdje pratimo sve ove događaje. Doviđenje.